so this is the last of our series kind of going through our uh, uh, vision statement as we set up catechism starting next month. And uh, I'd like to say that I think we all have a problem as humans, and it's, it's generally the same throughout all of us. And if you have a two-year-old, you know what it is. We're all selfish. We are, every one of us, a mess. And I think if we look down at the core of all the problems in this, plan, uh, in this world, they would have their core in selfishness. In fact, it's probably a, a synonym for sin, just flat being selfish. Whether it is your frustration with your spouse or your kids or your parents, whether it's your frustration with what's going on in this country or the Supreme Court, whether it is your frustration with your own drinking or porn or gossip issues, we struggle with those issues, you and me both, because we're born selfish. We've got a bent towards that. I called this uh, sermon, More Wine, Less Religion, which is kind of ironic, because I might be the only person in here that doesn't drink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm supposed to be a pastor, so anyway. So I looked up definition for religion, and, and you can get a thousand different ones, but if you p kind of pull them together, this comes from a few of them. Religion is a system of institutionalized religious practices. That is to say, things set apart and things forbidden. So throughout this series, we've talked about how there's two different faith systems, and every faith system but Christianity says, okay, we need this religious system of things set apart, things holy, and things forbidden. And if we do more set apart things, holy things, than we do forbidden things, then things might work out for us. So every other faith system in the world says, I, I'm, I'm reaching to God. That's my definition for religion. My dad used to define religion simply as man's attempt to reach God. And that's it. And I'm saying we don't need more religion, we need more wine. And uh, we're going to look at the story of when Jesus turns water into wine. I, I shared a Babylon Bee meme. I don't know if any of you go to that site, but it's my favorite site. And uh, after, after car sites. And uh, yeah, anyway, it shows this class. And it says, Baptist Sunday School, they're showing changing water into Welch's. And they got the, anyway. <laughs> That's how I grew up. Um, Baptist where we didn't drink. When I talk about wine, Jesus changes water into wine. The whole story is about transformation. It's saying, I am the creator. You fill these things to the brim. They're to the top with water. They're going to transform into something totally different. I am the transforming God. And so we don't need more religion. We don't need more work. We don't need to try harder. You can do that till you die. You'll never get to heaven and you'll still be sinning. Because the issue isn't our sinning. The issue is our core sin. That bent towards selfishness. God has to come and change that core. That will change our behavior, but the behavior is not the issue. The issue is our core. So it's a, it's a sermon on transformation. Jesus turns water into wine, sinner to say, death to life. And throughout scripture you see those stories of Rahab going from a prostitute to being in the line of Christ. Gideon being a wimp to being a general. Zacchaeus being an IRS thief to being one who's generous. Ronaldo gave a line that I wrote down at uh, the prayer meeting on Wednesday that probably would have better big, been a better big idea for the sermon than what I chose. And that was it's the glory of God to transform lives. Isn't that beautiful? It's the glory of God to transform lives. He loves to do it. He wants to do it. It's not something we have to plead for. It's something he came down to do for us. Jesus changes who we are. He changes what we believe. And that changes how we live. So our little vision statement is to be a gospel-centered family impacting our community with the hope of Christ. The question is, what's the hope of Christ? The hope of Christ is that Christ will transform us as we trust in him. That's the big idea, that Christ will transform us as we trust in him. If he does not transform us as we trust in him, then we are hopeless. He needs to transform me from sinner to saint. 
He needs to transform me from selfish to generous. So if you got, not if you got your Bibles, you got your Bibles, because they're in the chair in front of you. Uh, turn to John chapter 2, would you? It's page 724. John chapter 2. And I want to set this up a little bit, uh, what's going on. This is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. He's around 30 years old, and he's starting his small group. For us, this is small group Sunday, and so we have a bunch of booths back there. And as Sue announced at the beginning, when, when we dismiss after church, and you go to all those booths and you get your little thing clipped. They have uh, a, a, a giveaway that they donated. A, it's like a 60-inch TV. Anyway. Um, but uh, you can go around and see what all the different small groups are, are doing. And Jesus is at the beginning of his ministry, and he's starting his small group. Now, he's starting it for a couple of reasons. I used to always think Jesus got the 12 together so that when he was gone, they could start the church. He did, but he also got the 12 together so that Jesus could be in a small group. He's divine, but he's also human, and he needs that group around him. And he's getting that group started. That's what he does in John chapter 1. And he gets five different people. This is the beginning of getting his disciples that want to be transformed. He has John, who is writing this book, who really is looking at, at God as the one who takes the, the words of this and, and brings them to life. What a cool transformation. Just makes these words come alive in a person. Andrew understands that he's a sinner and he wants to be clean. Peter seems to want a change of his, his very identity. Nathaniel sees Jesus as the one who can change the world, and Philip wants direction and purpose in his life. So he wants to change from a wanderer to someone who's got purpose. Jesus does all those things. He's our hope. He's our transforming God. So they were in Bethany when he, when he calls the last couple of them, and they're invited to a wedding um, that's about a two-and-a-half-day journey away. So they go and travel over there, Jesus and his disciples. Uh, Mary's there. She's just called Jesus' mom. And uh, she seems to be a person of authority. And uh, she's probably a widow by this time. We think that uh, Joseph may have died sometime in Jesus' teen years, someplace in, in her, her late teens. And uh, so she may actually be working. She may be an employee taking over things at, at the wedding to bring some money home. Uh, and one other thing about it is, is um, and probably maybe nobody cares but me, but because I grew up where... Um, Drinking was akin to mass murder. Uh, the question is, is he changing this into wine or is he changing it into grape juice? And uh, again, as maybe the only one in here that doesn't drink, I have to admit, he's changing it into wine. Um, from the research I've done, the grapes ripened in Palestine from June to September. They fermented October to May. Anytime in October to May, if they had had wine, it would have been fermented. Uh, the use was restricted. Drunkenness was forbidden. And it, was, and it was also, often, especially if it was table wine, it was diluted one part wine to three parts water. That was enough to, to still keep it, it, it purified. This, I don't think, was diluted at all because Jesus has it filled to the brim. I don't see any way it could have been diluted. Um, a little thought about that. Mike Bonzel sent me an email and we talked about this once before, and, and I found it fun. He talked about when uh, he was a kid, he was about 11 years old, and they spent a month at his grandparents' house, and his grandpa was total abstinence, no, no drinking at all. And, but his dad, Mike's dad, always liked to have a glass of bourbon at night before supper, right? So they go to grandpa's house. Grandpa's got bourbon in the living room cabinet. And every night before dinner, he'd get it out. The grandpa would get it out for Mike's dad. So Mike gets older, and he, and he says, okay, that's weird. And so he went to, to his grandpa and said, why did you do that? And here's a quote where his grandpa answered it. He said, abstinence is a choice. Hospitality is a commandment. <laughs> Not bad. Okay. One last thing in, in setup is this story is all about Jesus and wine. It doesn't even give his mom's name. We don't know the name of the bride. We don't know the name of the broom. We don't know how they got there. We don't know any of that kind of stuff. All we know is Jesus and the wine. That's what the story is focused on. And that's why some of the names are left out. Okay, John chapter 2. On the third day, in other words, it took them three days to get there from Bethany. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mom was there, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. 
When the wine was gone, Jesus' mom said to him, we have no more wine. Now that doesn't sound like that big of a deal. But it's a long way to go to a uh, total wine store. <laughs> it, and, and this is a, Cana, this is a small community, maybe nine miles or so from Nazareth where, where Mary lived. And so this would have been, a, as a community, this is going to be a community wedding. This is a community deal. And, and it's up, especially to the groom, to make sure there's going to be enough wine. Mary may have been partly responsible for that. This is a huge, just a huge blowing it if they run out of wine. And by the way, the wedding was a week long. Okay, it's a week long ceremony. The groom's going to look really bad. And it's, it's almost a bit of an omen. Like, well, they ran out of wine. I wonder how long the wedding is going to last. You know what I mean? So Mary's worried about it. It's like I did, uh, last morning I did was over at, at Corbin's house. And, and, and Micah comes over to our house, our son. I'm kind of going over the notes last minute, right? Put everything, I get everything together. He comes over, grabs Jolene. We zip over to their house. And it's, I don't know, 15 minutes away or something. We live close to here and they live on Sur Northern-ish. And we go over there. The wedding's going to be in the backyard. We're there an hour early. We're talking to everybody. About 10 minutes before the wedding goes, I go to get my notes. No notes. I look in the truck. No notes. I had left them at the house when Micah came, right, and jumped in the truck. I've been sitting there for 45 minutes. So now it's 10 minutes till the wedding. I've got to go all the way home. I get in the truck. I'm trying to go home. And I know I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to obey the law. Romans 13 says obey the law. But I'm really trying to... to Find a gray area in there, you know, as much as I can as I'm going down at Adelia. And what happens is someone comes in front of me. I think it was a Prius. It's always a Prius. And they're going like three miles an hour under the limit. But there's a double yellow line, so I can't per pass a person going three miles an hour. Well, I can pass a person going three miles. But I've got this anchor point sticker on the back of the truck. <laughs> it's one of those kind of moments for the bride and groom. Thankfully, by the time I got back, we live in New Mexico, and everyone thought it was a normal start time. <laughs> Verse 4, Jesus answers, Woman, why do you involve me? Now, that sounds rude. In the culture, the term he used wasn't rude. Just trust me on that. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. So his mom said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, that whole thing is just hard for me to figure out what's going on. Woman, my hour has not yet come. But as you go through John, woman, my hour has not yet come, really looks like he's saying, I'm just now starting to gather my 12. I don't even have my small group together yet. And I've got the cross coming. My hour is the cross. I came here to die for the sins of the world. I am God with skin on. And you're worried about having enough drink at a wedding? Don't you realize why I came here? Everything that he did was in the shadow of the cross. When I think of what Jesus did for you and me, that is one of the greatest things. I, I can't imagine the horror of being crucified. But as great or greater than that, I think, is living your life knowing you're going to the, be crucified. Just having that hanging over your head. He says, well, that, this isn't my time yet. It's coming. But you're worried about wine? And then, but I love her answer. She says, do whatever he tells you. I, and, and please don't take this kind of like sacrilegious on Mary, but I think she's as clueless as we are. You know, she says, hey, can you make this wine? My hour has not yet come. And she's like, just do whatever he tells you. Now, I, I don't think she knew what he meant. I think she just said, you know what? I know God is good. I know my son is good. I really don't understand this whole deity and Christ kind of thing. All I know is you're a good Jewish boy. And just do what he says, okay? <laughs> Here's why I love that. So many times I pray, and I don't have a clue. I really don't know what to ask for. So I can just pray, God, I know you're good. I'm just, I'm just going to walk the walk. I know you're good. Just help me walk the walk. So they do. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. And uh, they didn't have sinks, you know, to wash up in, so they had these outside the place. Wouldn't have been inside, would have been outside. 
They each held 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they fill them to the brim. So they're outside of where the main wedding thing is because you washed outside and, and then you went in. And the Jews were, were concerned, especially about ceremonial washing. When you're having an event like this, you wash your hands before you go into the place. So this is dirty water. This is dishwater outside. Would have been at least 120 gallons. Verse 8, then he told them, draw some of the water out and take it to the master of the banquet. The master of the banquet would have been like the head waiter, the, the guy in charge of all the stuff going on. So if Mary's employed, she's somewhere between this master of the banquet and the servants. <clears throat> they did that. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants had drawn the water out. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheap wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you saved the best until now. Now, again, I don't know squat about wine, but I've got a picture um, there of that is Chateau Margaux. My brother would know all about it. I'm sure I pronounced it wrong. But anyway, was it close? Anyway, <laughs> Ronaldo says no. All right. But... Okay, and that's what's on the front of your bulletin. This is the most expensive wine that no one bothered to drink. Uh, it is from 1787, and some poor waiter knocked it off the table. Insurance had to pay $225,000 for that one bottle of wine. Jesus created you know, over 200 gallons of the best wine tasted. And what was that worth? Um, you don't create good wine, I'm told, without age. And uh, I've leaned into this before, but it's just a, a, a perfect example of, of, of how God creates. And uh, I know some of you struggle with the whole Genesis account, but the, I, I just... Um, I don't know why that wine couldn't have been 200 years old and two minutes, year, two minutes old. Both would have been true. Uh, when God created Adam, he didn't create an infant. I know what came first, the chicken or the egg. The chicken. Because God created our earth with age. He created adults. He created animals that were grown. And he created wine with age. I think the disciples and the servants got that. They understood he's not just turning water into wine. He's creating something brand new. He's reaching into time and space and doing something only God can do. Verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs to which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed him. Notice he calls it a sign, not a miracle. As John goes through, there's all kinds of signs that Jesus is really God. He doesn't call them miracles because he says the reason these were done is to be a signpost that this guy isn't just a guy. In chapter 6, he takes five loaves and two fish, and he feeds 5,000 people, and he calls himself the bread of life. In chapter 9, he opens the eyes of a man born blind, and he calls himself the light of the world. In chapter 11, he raises Lazarus from the dead, and he has power over death and life. Here, he changes water into wine. Why? To show that Jesus will transform you and me if we trust in him. If he can transform water into wine, if he can reach down into time and space, he can reach down into our heart. He can make us something new. A couple of thoughts about just being transformed, because we all need it. We're all selfish. We need a new heart. We need not to just stop sinning. We need a new heart. We need a new direction. We need a new purpose. We need Jesus. And I'd like to look here about what he does for that. First, Jesus pursues us. He took a two- to three-day journey to go to this wedding just to create wine, just to bring joy, show his disciples who he was. I've talked before about God's manipulative grace. I believe that in his grace, he's reached down in my life and, and turned things to help me walk towards him. As a kid, I had the grace to hear the story about how Jesus came and died and rose for me and was able to lean into that. 
there was a time when I was going a whole other direction in my life, and God, in his grace, closed the company I was working for, moved me off to a camp in Texas that moved me off to a different college in Texas that moved me off to this strawberry blonde in Texas, and nothing changed since I met her. I think it was his manipulative grace that brought the merger of two churches together. I think it's manipulative grace that's allowing us to go to a couple services. In my little hundred word story, you're going to hear other people's stories today, but in my little story, I just say I have no regrets for following Christ. Every, every regret I have is when I've tried to go the other way. I have no regrets for following Christ. And more than once, I believed he saved me from stupid. Um, I think you're here because of his manipulative grace. I believe he pursues every one of us. Secondly, he gives over and above. I don't know what Mary was asking for if she was asking him to go get, you don't get six packs of wine, do you? I don't know, six bottles of wine. I don't know what she thought he was, Jesus was going to do, but I doubt she thought 200 gallons or 120 gallons. Ephesians 3 says he's able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. He gives over and above. Third, he gives the best. Not Welch's, but the best. In the past, God gave us his son. who died on the cross and rose again for us. In the future, he's giving us a new home in heaven. Don't you think he wants the best for you here? And kind of my favorite is, I think he gives the unnecessary. God gives us over and above unnecessarily what we don't even deserve. You know, it's in that story, the, uh, uh, the head waiter goes off to the groom and says, wow, way to go. You saved the best for last. No one ever does that. Man, you put on the best wedding yet. And what's the groom doing? Sitting there with his mouth open. He has no idea what's going on. That's what God wants to do for us, I think. It's just he gives us over and above abundantly more than we can ask or think because he's just a gracious God. He unnecessarily gives us what we don't deserve. Jesus doesn't even take credit for it. He just, he just lets it go. And we look at our lives. We used to sing an old song in church, count your blessings, name them one by one. Uh, we don't do that enough of the things that God has given us. That's his part in this whole relationship and transformation. But we have a part in it too. Uh, we need to, first, I just wrote down trust in his word. The servants took the water to the master of the ceremony. I'd have been scared to do that. But they obeyed his word. They followed through. I, we got to believe it. I put a little flyer in your bulletin. It just said transformed from. If you give your life to Christ, if you follow him, these things are true. We go from his enemy to his friend, from lonely to love, from facing punishment to forgiven. From conquered by sin, we're victorious over sin. We don't have to live that way anymore. We were on the shelf, but we were bought with a price. We're no longer a slave to sin, but we're adopted as a child of God. We go from selfish, which is how we're born with that bent towards us, to gracious. We become a new creation. Trust in his word. Third, we need to trust in his goodness. Mary, I, I really don't think she knew what he was saying when he, you know, when he was talking about my hours not that come, but she, but she just says, you know, do what he says. Just follow him. She trusted in his goodness. We trust in Christ alone because God is good all the time. That's why, by the way, when we baptize, we go all under and come up because following Christ is about going all in. She had no plan B but Jesus. Third, trust where you are. If you don't know Jesus, if you haven't given your life to him, all I can say is trust what you know where you are. You'll never get all the answers solved. You'll never, you know, answer all your questions about certain things you may have. There are things that are taught in Scripture that I don't like, but I believe because I know God is good all the time. All the time, God is good, and I trust him for that. But these disciples had said believe. What did they believe? And they believed that this guy they had just started following three days ago was a transforming God. 
and they're going to follow him wherever that led. They didn't know all the other stuff there is to know, and a million years from now, we'll still be learning more stuff. They didn't know it all. They just knew he was a transforming God, and they wanted to follow him. I'm saying, what do you know about God? He's a, he's a good God who died on the cross for our sins and rose again, and he's making a place for us. Therefore, he wants something good for us now, so I'm going to trust in him, and I'm going to follow him. And Lord willing, as I follow him, some of these difficult questions he'll answer for me later, but right now it's between me and God. What do I know? He's a transforming God. It's like I love that guy in Matthew 9 who tells Jesus, I believe, just help my unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief. God will change who we are. He will change what we believe, and he'll change how we live because it's the glory of God to transform lives. And then trust the best is yet to come. Remember the old, I think it was a Michelob ad that said, this is as good as it gets. They're all on the beach or something, and this is as good as it gets in their ad. No. Lord willing, this is as bad as it'll ever be if you know Jesus. This is it. This is the worst. Because Jesus is coming back, and the best wine is saved for last. It's the glory of God to transform lives, so he will transform us as we trust in him. If uh, you are one of the small group leaders that is sharing today, you wrote down your testimony, can you come on up here? Uh, there's a verse in Psalms, Psalms 107, and the whole passage in Psalms 107 is talking about people whose lives are transformed. That you've been slaves, you've been here, you've been doing this, you've been doing this. Um, you've been far from God, and I've done this to you. And then here's what it says about our lives. What he's done. You've got to come all the way up because this is your microphone. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. God is good? It says, has the Lord redeemed you? In other words, has he bought you? Has he trained you? Has he transformed you? Then speak out, he says. Exalt him publicly before the congregation. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to do the command from Psalms 107. So each of these folks leads a small group. They're just going to very quickly say their name, the group they lead, and how God transformed them. So you got a line? Uh, that's the mic over there you're going to have to go to. Good morning. If I were a little taller, a lot more athletic, and better looking, I'd be Joe Corbin. Uh, my name is Joe Corbin, and I'm a recovering non-Christian. I came to Cottonwood, now Anchor, put, uh, anchor Point, <laughs> to, to please my wife and kids. We joined the Holderman Life Group, and I would go, but I wouldn't really talk, and I didn't really want to be there. As time went on, I found fellowship with the men of the group, and it started working towards a life with God in it. In fact, I found my way back to Jesus. I was baptized, and I now lead the Holderman, now Corbin group, on Sundays. My life has changed because of Jesus. He sent me those that supported me, those that were there in tough times, and those that have helped me grow in my relationship with him. Hi, I'm Edie Downs, and my husband and I lead the Wednesday night group down south in Paradise Hills. Um, we meet at 6.30 most weeks. I accepted Christ as a child um, but my parents divorced, and by my teen years and into my 20s, I had become arrogant, and I thought I could do what I wanted and still partake of God's grace. Uh, but when Jeff and I met and got married, he really pressed for us to join the church, and we began Bible study together. And uh, I realized anew what Christ had done for me and how he reaches into my life even when I stray. Um, to pull me back and just love me. It hasn't been without obstacles or troubles, but I completely trust in him. And I know with all my heart and head that he's my only hope. Hi, I'm Sharon Newberg, and I lead the, facilitate and lead the Monday night women's Bible study. We meet every Monday night at 6.30. Um, I grew up in a small South Texas town of about 4,000 people, and it seems like I have known Jesus forever. Um, I was raised in a Christian home. I gave my life to Jesus on April the 19th, the 1962. However, I, for a while, I strayed from following Jesus and tried to do my things my way. 
After my parents died, I started looking for something to fill the longing that they had left in my heart. I studied many different theories, um, many different um, religious philosophies, but none of them could help. Finally, a dear friend reminded me of Jesus and my commitment many years ago. I started to study everything I could about Jesus through his word. He filled me with his spirit and his love completely, filling that longing for peace in my heart. I have had many losses and tragic events since then, but God has been by my side. He has never failed me. So never again will I turn from my Lord and Savior, but trust him fully to lead me through this life and the next. Hi, my name is Rhonda. My husband Rick and I host an anchor group in our home on the first and third Tuesdays of the month at 6.30 and we're in River's Edge 3. I'm a wife, mother, and grandmother and a retired teacher. I grew up in church and heard about Jesus as a very young child. I remember talk, people talking about Jesus as if he were a real person and was right there in the room with us. I wanted to have that very personal relationship that I saw other people have. When I was eight years old, I went forward in the church service. I didn't understand everything about God or salvation, but I sincerely surrendered my heart to God that day. I immediately felt a presence in my life, and he has never left me since. Hi, my name is Sue, and my group is Mothers of Adult Children Prayer and Support Group. And we meet on the third Wednesday of the month at 6.30 p.m. in the Anchor Point Annex right over there. My personal story involves a flowery bus with Jesus Saves written across the side of it. You guys can all picture that. That pulled into my neighborhood back in the late 60s. The focus was on, their focus was on God's anger over our sin with little mention of his love for us sinners. So I, very quickly, being 12 years old, made the wise choice to give my life to Christ, but for all the wrong reasons. Through the years, I grew in my love for God, but was never sure of God's love for me. It wasn't until I was grown and found a scriptural church did I learn just how profoundly God loved me. Now God has called me to create a ministry where we can share the blessings and struggles of parenting our adult children. It's the greatest opportunity, and I love this group so, so much. God is so good, and I can't wait to see what he has for me next. <laughs> My name is Sherry, and I lead one of the women's Bible study groups. As a child, I had enough Sunday school to know about God, Jesus, and the cross, and I believed what little I heard. I had a desire to be good, and I prayed general prayers to a distant God. As a young wife and stay-at-home mom of two toddlers, I was feeling frustrated, guilty, overwhelmed, and even depressed. And as a parent, I wanted to know God better, and I wanted to know why I believed. And I knew that meant knowing what the Bible had to say. So in my first Bible study, which actually was on John 2, I realized that God was a personal God. That Jesus not only died for my sins, but he wanted to be intimately involved with me and in every part of my life. I asked Jesus to be my Savior and Lord, knowing that I could live by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit changed everything, and it continues to transform me. Hi, I'm Cheryl Daniels. My husband and I lead a small group, as well as we are in children's ministry. Our small group meets on the first and third Friday at 6. Um, families are welcome. We have a person, our daughter usually, who is our child care corraller. And um, in the summertime, there's an extra little perk. We have a swimming pool. Um, and we also eat before we, we do anything else. Um, I grew up in a home uh, where we practiced Christianity only on holidays. And especially if my grandmother came to visit, then we for sure found a, a way to go to church. Um, I, I knew God, but he was mean to me. And I always wanted to be just good enough for him so that I could, uh, well, I could get to heaven. 
So I, I did everything I could. I, I, I just did what I was supposed to do and didn't question anything. But I, God became more real to me when I was a preteen during VBS, and it was in a, in a town in Mississippi that I went to VBS, and because of perfect attendance, I, I received my own Bible. And I never knew that I could read the Bible. I didn't know that you were allowed to. So that was really encouraging for me. But I still felt like I needed to be good enough for God. And it wasn't until later on as, I, as an adult, and I hit some tragedies in my life, you know, trying to go my own way, that I realized that going to church and learning that God loves me no matter what, no matter who, no matter what I've done, and I didn't have to be good enough because he was good enough on the cross. So his sacrificial blood cleansed me of anything else that I thought I could do on my own. So I know now that it's not anything that I've done because I could never be good enough. It's only what he has done for me. And so now I also know that I can't be too far away from God because he's always going to hold on to me no matter what. Hello, my name is Errol, and I lead the Men's Tuesday Morning Fellowship. I grew up in a somewhat of a religious house, um, but not quite committed to attending church uh, on a regular basis. And I did go to a uh, Catholic high school. But when I graduated, I felt empty. I felt lost. And my heart was just, it yearned for God. And I, I didn't know what else to do but keep searching. I took a job at Sperry where a guy, his name was Coop Cooper. And he, cut, he started carrying his Bible into work. And I, one day I just said, dude, what's this about the Bible? And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, Jesus is where it's at. <laughs> and it hit me like a ton of bricks right between the forehead, my forehead. And um, so I got a hold of a New Testament, spent time in it, and next you know, about four months later, he led me to the Lord. And that day has changed my life forever. And the key scripture that really made a difference for me was John 14, 6. And that is... Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan. My wife and I run our Friday night group at our house, and we meet usually every Friday night. Uh, when I came back from Vietnam, I was full of uh, hate, anger, frustration, fear, all the crazy stuff that goes on through your head. and that incredible desire to be in control. Anybody ever had it? Anyway, one day though I learned that as all this was going on that Jesus was with me and pursuing me. And I knew that he was crying. I surrendered my life to him at the cross and I found out that I got one simple job. Live my life for him and keep him smiling. Thank you. Well, good morning, and despite what your brain might think, my name is Tommy Gay. <laughs> I am a small group leader here, and we meet on the second and fourth Wednesdays, about five minutes off in that direction. I grew up in a home where my mother took me to church regularly, and I was baptized in the Baptist church. However, I never had a personal relationship with Jesus, and as I grew up and left home, I found myself living for the fleeting pleasures of this world. This lifestyle left me empty and without any long-term hope. Through work associations, I became involved with a local Christian church and the youth pastor there. One night at a Bible study, I finally asked the people to pray for me because my heart was pounding like a bass drum for no apparent reason. Later that evening, I realized that the Bible was the truth and I asked Jesus to forgive my sins and be my savior. This was a transforming point in my life. I now have hope, purpose, and meaning to life as I live for my Lord and Savior, Jesus. Tommy. My name is Jonathan. I lead an anchor group with my wife over here in River's Edge, and we meet on the second and third Wednesday of every month from 6 to 8 p.m. 
I grew up in a Christian home, and sometime in high school, I began wondering why I was going to church and whether I believed simply because it was a birthright. I didn't think I needed anything else. After college, I headed to a lush African island where I was exposed to a people whose faith intrigued me, and I began to read my Bible more regularly. Then I headed to the deserts of the southwest where I lost a friend in a car accident. I was married, had children, and began experiencing how gracious our God is and how deep his love is for me. It isn't always comfortable, but my walk with God has been rewarding and flipped my world around, for which I am eternally grateful. Can you stand with us and, uh, and steal a line from Mark Smith and give God a hand for transforming lives? Heavenly Father, we thank you for grace. We thank you that your word is true. Thank you that uh, you do things much greater than turn water into wine. But you turn lives around, you wash away sin, you give us hope, you give us a purpose, you give us a new direction. Father, all our hope is in you. In your name we pray, amen.